leadership is individual and the people you are leading are all individuals. And you need to understand yourself well enough to know how you impact people. And you need to understand your people so that you know what will work best for them. You can't lead everybody the same way. An introvert will respond differently to a certain style of leadership than the extrovert will. Mm -hmm. Um, We've all got, you know, ways of how we work in the world, ways of how we do things. So to understand your people as individuals and to understand your own values and what it means, what leadership means to you. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Coffee Break Podcast, where our mission is to share business ideas, practices, and strategies while we enjoy our cup of coffee. Today is all about leadership, and it's interesting. uh, It's not in the typical form that I think that we've addressed it in the past. I think there's some interesting nuggets and takeaways here, and I hope that you'll gain some insights from this today. Our guest is Grace Judson, a wealth of knowledge, lots of uh, interesting thought processes here. It's going to make you think. So, approach this with an open mind. It should be exciting for you. Another thing that you should do, and and I would not really put a lot of thought into this, is making sure you subscribe if you have not already. Just click the button. It's pretty simple, straightforward. Uh, Wherever you're listening to this on whatever platform you're on, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Uh, If you would like to see the video version of this as well and follow along there, we have it on Facebook and YouTube. You can check those out. Make sure you subscribe. We have a brand new episode every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. that is released for you. So uh, in order for you not to miss a single one of those, you would want to subscribe. So make sure you check that out. You can find all the episodes online at lockdoc.net slash podcast. Now, grab a cup of coffee. Get ready for this conversation. We got so much to say. We got a podcast to make. We're sipping on lattes. And it's time for a coffee break. It's time for a coffee break. Oh, yeah. Grace Judson, thank you for joining us today. I'm well, glad to have you here. You said you were from Southwest Arkansas, Northwest Arkansas. Northwest, that's very different. Right, right near the where Walmart headquarters. Oh, naturally. Well, tell them we said hi. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I found interesting on your website was the fact that you said you were a leadership geek, um, mm-hmm. and that is a really cool title to give yourself. And so we're going to be uh, diving into some of those topics to, today. Hopefully, uh, we'll stay as much on point as possible. But one of the really neat things that I saw that I really want to ask questions about is the mm-hmm. uh, the elephant in the conference room, the office politicking thing. I really want to uncover that or unpack that a little bit if we uh, have the ability to jump into that today. But But as always, before we do any of those types of things, we do have to uh, tackle rapid fire. Five randomly selected questions just to get under your skin with unknown point values. Are you ready? Sure. All right. Question number one. What do you find extremely difficult that most people find simple? Talking about myself in a personal sort of way. Talking about yourself in a personal way? Mm Mm-hmm. I can see that. Well, do you want to tell us anything personal about yourself? I think I just did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here. Okay, here. We're going to dive into this one. And hey, this, you said, you know, this look, is about getting under the skin. So it is. I, you know, it is. And, turnabout's fair play. And the great thing <laughs> is it's all very random and I have zero control over these. So the next question, just yeah. to follow up on that is, do you have any unusual, unusual fears no, I think my fears are all pretty normal. <laughs> <laughs> all, my, all my fears are very usual. Yeah. If there are 100 people, how many of them would be more patient than you? Oh, that completely depends on what we're being patient about. It's very situational. So you have situational patience. I have situational patience. I can be endlessly patient with a client uh, or with somebody that I'm coaching and working with. Hmm. Uh, but if it's technology that is not behaving the way I want it to, I have had to restrain myself from throwing my computer through the window. Interesting. Now, so. mind you, I grew up in tech, so I have some experience and knowledge, probably enough to be dangerous, about how things are supposed to work, which is where the patience fails. Intriguing. <laughs> Intriguing. So patients with people, especially if they're clients, 
Patients with people who are really doing their best. If I think somebody is just sort of phoning it in, Mm. then I might get, I don't know if impatient is exactly the right term, but I will start to push. Okay. I like it. Question number four, have you ever been punished for something that you didn't do? Oh, I'm sure I have. I couldn't name any of it, but I, I haven't we all? <laughs> That's a great question. I'm pretty sure I was punished for everything that I did. I'm sure. I, well, I'm sure I wasn't <laughs> punished for some things that I should have been punished for, but for something I didn't do. Yeah, I can remember some times early in grade school or something where somebody thought I had done, a teacher thought I had done something that I didn't do. All right. Final question. Number five. What was a situation that you thought would be terrible, but you actually enjoyed it? Hmm. I'm generally a pretty positive person. Um, (laughs) Okay. I actually can circle that one right back to your first question. There have been some situations in group programs where I have had to answer some questions that were extremely uncomfortable. But in the end, there's there in groups that have come together, um, not just sort of randomly, but have come together for a particular purpose or around a particular topic or who have been together for a while, you can actually get a lot more support than you might be expecting. Very cool. All right. Well, congratulations. You passed rapid fire. There you have it. We we'll give you a score of 612. <laughs> and how did you calculate that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's it's a very detailed formula that we use. Ah, okay. There must be a spreadsheet there somewhere. There, yeah, there's tons, tons of spreadsheets behind the scenes that are calculating it in real time to be able to produce it at a the, just the moment. Artificial intelligence. All right. A little bit of that, too. Uh Yeah, artificial for sure. All right. Well, (laughs) again, thank you for joining us today um, for for the kind of the topic around leadership. You know, Mm -hmm. this podcast has really been dedicated over the years to be to talking about uh, business ideas, practices and strategies and focusing on kind of our. Uh, our audience that would be people that are trying to you know, grow a business, uh, operate a business, uh, maybe they're business owners, maybe they're managers, leaders in an organization. So, you know, when, when you talk about uh, you know the topic of leadership as a whole, um, mm-hmm. then it really kind of hits directly on on the the heart of this <coughs> this conversation. My initial question to you is, uh, why are you? Why do you consider yourself a leadership geek? I have been studying, philosophizing, thinking, working with, working as all of the things leadership. I I actually sometimes say that since I was two in some ways. No. Um, the ways in which we all are leaders and the ways in which the leaders in organizations and out in the world and community and government and, you know, and, and religious settings, um, we don't necessarily always recognize the kinds of impact that a leader has. Leaders are often very much focused on what it is they're trying to get done and on their own bubble of experience about that. And one of the things that I really hope to do in my work is to help people expand that and understand that the impact they have isn't just on the work they're trying to get done. The impact they have is on the people. And that impact has a ripple effect out into families and communities from the organization, if we're talking about organizational leadership. And so just the overall like kind of understanding of that has just kept you intrigued over the years and you just continue yeah. to dive into it. Yeah. Yeah. And because I really am interested in the ways that people think, why they do what they do, what impacts the ways that they act. And I I couldn't agree with you more. One of the things that you said before we started recording uh, was one of the, one uh, fact about leadership is that people can be a leader without a role or a title, and uh, that's me paraphrasing. So I, maybe clarify what a, that statement so that it's accurate, and then unpack it for me. Okay. Yes, people, you you have it accurately. People. We are all leaders, even if we don't have the role or the title or a specific responsibility. And I'm not saying that in the kind of way that, 
you know, our mothers patted us on the head and said, well, you're all very special, a, a special snowflake. I mean it very sincerely because, and I actually have a talk and a workshop on this um, called Meet Your Inner Leader, because here's the thing. Everything that we do has an impact on someone if somebody is observing it. Obviously, the things we do at home by ourselves, nobody's seeing it. That's not leadership. But if I go to the supermarket and I am kind to the checker, that has an impact on the people who see that. On the flip side, if I'm unkind, that also has an impact. And they have done studies that prove that. I just saw something this morning, in fact, that said that when a dysfunctional manager comes into a team as, a, as the new manager for that team, there is an immediate downgrade of performance and effectiveness in that team, even if it was doing well beforehand. Now, obviously, that is somebody who has the role of leader. But we can look at the ways in which we give each other permission by the things that we do and say. Seeing somebody do something or say something can inspire us to be more like that. Oh, look, they're doing that. That means I can do that too. And the important thing to recognize, aside from the importance of recognizing that, the important thing to recognize is that that does not have to be positive. Mm -hmm. I think we have seen an awful lot of the negative, the flip side of that, where people see somebody behaving badly and they take that as permission to do the same. And we see, of course, people doing good things, philanthropic things, kind things. And it can be, again, it doesn't have to be somebody on a very visible stage. It can be as simple as that experience in the checkout line at the grocery store. So diving into that example, because I, I think that's really practical because it once is taking it out of the, the work environment. But um, setting the tone. So you're you're the next person in line. You're You're at the grocery store and you're interacting with the cashier. And the way that you treat that individual is setting a tone or a standard or the bar, so to speak, for what others, how others may react. Now, that next person that steps up can either maintain that, level it up, or downgrade it based off of their leadership in that situation. Correct. But because they have seen a positive interaction, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, they are more likely to either maintain or level up. So setting the positive example has a higher uh, outcome of it being replicated or improving versus uh, someone that the example is set to interact negatively. Correct. And the flip side is true, too. And I think it's important to recognize that. Yeah. You know, so-called good leadership does not have to be leadership. Somebody, there's Ryan DeRusso, who's an, a writer and a journalist and, and thinker, and I'm going to butcher the, uh, the quote, but he basically said that he is very careful about talking about somebody who is a good leader because leaders can be effective without being leaders for good. Mm. And we can certainly look at history for that. I mean, there have been plenty of leaders in history who motivated and developed a lot of following and did a lot of stuff that wasn't necessarily for the betterment of humanity, let's say. Sure. So I mean, I'm, I'm very intrigued by, by this kind of thought process and conversation because it's I, I feel like I've kind of been approached by this before and, and challenged it. So in the in the sense Going back to this cashier example, and I don't want to, I don't want to content like just over okay. overly ride this, but it's very interesting to me. Um, so, say that the negative example is set, the negative interaction is set. Mm -hmm. The person in front of you is just a jerk. Your the the expectation may not be that you're a jerk as well, but that you just ignore them or you just don't interact at all because. It's just awkward, right? Mm -hmm. And then that just continues to perpetrate down the line. And the level of, I don't know, interaction there is just degraded over time until somebody comes in and says, hey, you know what? I'm not going to do this. Like, I'm right. going to level this up. 
Yes. And I mean, I think we've all been in that experience of somebody being a jerk in a cashier line. Mm. And we do get uncomfortable. I mean, if that's not our preferred mode of operation, Mm -hmm. we do get uncomfortable. And we, you know, we kind of look away from it and we don't want to behave the same way. But in some ways, that is abdicating our own responsibility for not being a jerk. It's also like, and, and, and maybe, maybe this is off base. I don't know. Just, I'm just processing this. Sure. It's this, it's a similar sense that you walk into different cultural environments or different, different areas. Maybe if you travel across the country, you go to different areas and the, there's a particular area that you see people walking around and it, you know, discarding their trash into a trash can or maybe you see other people that are uh, they there's staff there that's constantly cleaning up and sweeping and and making sure that the area is clean that seems like there's less likely the case that people are just going to throw their trash on the ground um, exactly other areas I, I recall this i was i was in an area one time and there was just it was just trash everywhere and a mm-hmm. guy opened like and it was just in the on the ground just everywhere and a guy opens up the car door and he has a bag of trash and he just literally throws it on the ground right beside the car and kicks it up to the curb and nobody said anything nobody did anything it was just the normal expected behavior now you take that into a different area and people are going to say something they're going to do like they're like hey what's going like or somebody else is going to come clean it up and pick it up right. because that's not the expectation but furthermore in an area that that's not expected the likelihood that that guy opens his car door and throws the trash out is probably minimized right and they've done studies on this in terms of how what happens in areas when they clean up and how things change um, I couldn't cite any of them. It's been too long since I've read them, but they, they have looked exactly that kind of thing. All right, so... Managing your facility, properties, and projects is hard enough. Trying to find an emailed quote in your overflowing inbox is just one more annoyance, especially if there are multiple versions. We're working hard to make your life easier by providing all the information you need in one place. Now you can request service at a date and time that works for you. And we're making it easier to see quotes and materials needed for specific openings, including photos, so that you can approve everything from the convenience of your phone or computer. Log in to start using it now. Visit customer.lockdoc.net. This this other component that you just kind of hit on is this effective leaders versus good leaders, uh, or at least being aware of how you're talking, because leadership can happen for good or bad. I think you you kind of just alluded to that. Um, why Why does that matter? Why, how can it not matter? I mean, if we are going to be effective and a good, if we are going to be a leader for good, Mm -hmm. we're going to get more done. We're going to have the kind of impact on the world that one hopes we want to have. Uh, Now, you could say that if I were to sit here being an evil leader, that I would still be having the impact that I want to have. Mm -hmm. But assuming that you and your podcast listeners are people who want to leave a positive mark on the world, then it matters that we are intentional, which is a word I use carefully because I think it's often overused, but that we think about it that we consider the kind of impact that we are having and that we recognize the fact that although, I mean, none of us are perfect, perfect would really be very boring, um, but it's also not attainable. So we're saved from being bored by being perfect. Um, But we're going to make mistakes, but then you need to repair those mistakes as a leader. And that is part of what is being a leader for good, a leader on the positive side of the equation. And that, again, has an impact on your people, on the people around you, your peers. Um, and then everybody, you know, goes home and that impact ripples out because we know that the physiological, not to, the emotional and physiological impact of stress and anxiety and leaders being Again, I hate to use the word toxic, and I just went on a long rant about that on LinkedIn recently. But um, we know that that has an impact on people's mental and physical health. So why would we not want to be 
conscious of what it is that we're doing and how we're doing it so that we can have a positive effect on people's mental and emotional and physical health. So here's a question for you. If if somebody's listening to this right now, uh, maybe a manager or, or anybody really in, in mm-hmm. any type of an organization, and they go, hold on a second. So what can I do starting today, starting tomorrow, that is going to start to change that thing in a positive manner? How do I start to lead in that aspect? Get out of your own head. Um, I mean, I'm not, this is all easier said than done. Okay. I just want to make that point before I dive into this, but as they say, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And there you go. Um, a friend of mine is fond of saying we are all an experiment of one. And I am fond of saying that we, everyone is an individual with their own ways of doing things. Leadership is individual and the people you are leading are all individuals. And you need to understand yourself well enough to know how you impact people. And you need to understand your people so that you know what will work best for them. You can't lead everybody the same way. And just to take a really blatant example, an introvert will respond differently to a certain style of leadership than the extrovert will. Mm -hmm. Um, We've all got you know, ways of how we work in the world, ways of how we do things. So to understand your people as individuals and to understand your own values and what it means, what leadership means to you. One of the real challenges that I see in all the organizations that I work with and the people that I work with is that we don't take the the time to define our terms. So I had one leadership team in a small company that I was working with where they had they were really struggling to come together on agreement about how to move forward with the organization. And at the core of it, and it was obviously more complex than this, but the core of this, the root cause was that they each had a slightly different definition of success and they had never stopped to understand what each of them thought success was and what they thought success for the organization was. So if you don't know your values, if you don't understand what they are and hold yourself and your organization accountable to them, because that's the other thing that a lot of organizations do is they go, you know, okay, we have these corporate values. Isn't that pretty big poster on the wall? It's on our website, yay us. But then they don't operationalize it Mm -hmm. so that the employees know Okay, we have this value of whatever it may be, integrity, let's just say, because everybody loves to have a value of integrity. Um, I actually explain why I don't, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, How are employees expected to behave? What are the things that what are the actions and how are they held accountable to behave with behaving with integrity within their teams, within with customers, if they're customer facing with their managers, the whole thing. You have to operationalize this stuff. And that is where you start to really get into leading. I'll say it. I didn't set it up this way intentionally, but leading with integrity, leading with the ideal that we are all individuals and we do. I think one of the things that the pandemic really brought out is that people want a sense of being seen and understood within their organizations. And that includes understanding what the organizational values are and their own values. And is there an alignment? Because if there isn't an alignment, then the best leadership in the world is probably not going to make them feel like they fit in that organization. Uh, That was a long ramble. (laughs) No, there's a lot of value out of it. I want to kind of repeat some of the stuff that I heard uh, from you and maybe get clarity on it. So, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the the joys that I have in life is, you know, I get to meet a lot of people and and talk to them. And, uh, you know, a lot of people like to introduce themselves and give their their title uh, or their, you know, their their job title. And I often say, okay, that's great. What do you do? Um, mm-hmm. and, and get them to actually explain what that means. I'm the senior vice president of operations and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, what do you do? Well, I 
work on spreadsheets and set up meetings. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's like trying to figure out exactly what that title or what that role is defined as. Right. And what you just said or what I just heard you say was, um, you know, a lot of organizations don't take the time to define the words that they're using on a regular basis. And so if you are using a specific, a particular set of, uh, of, of, of words or uh, terms in your organization, or you're creating kind of your own vocabulary, which a lot of people do, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of those acronyms that get floated around people, you know, even in our industry and in our business, we, use certain terms differently than other people might. And so uh, taking time to explain what that means. And now you you kind of started there and then you said where you see that played out is we've got these pretty posters on the wall that says this is what we're about. And we assume that everybody understands what that intent was when it was established. So how is it that we can st- – step back. And so you you said this, and so I want to get you to clarify it or maybe dive into it a little bit more. Operationalize those values or operationalize mm-hmm. what we're about as an organization. What do you mean when you say that? I mean that it's all very well. It's a lot easier to put the poster on the wall than to actually establish norms of behavior that mean that you're walking the talk of those words. So at every level of the organization, and I know some organizations that do this, Mm -hmm. very sadly few, but at every level of the organization, everyone should know exactly what is meant by that value, those values, and should know what it is that they are authorized and expected to do in order to demonstrate that they are aligned with adhering to whatever, however you want to put it, those values. So the values are operationalized in the sense that everyone is operating according to those values. Okay. Let me, uh, let me ask you this and and kind of put ourselves out there a little bit and you can critique it. Uh, With our core values in our organization, one of the things that we do on a, we try to be consistent basis is not just have we we actually currently in this by the time this actually airs this may be void null and void but we currently do not have our core values plastered on any posters inside the building i uh, good <laughs> well tr- transparently we have uh we have all of the design ready to order them we just haven't done it yet oh, okay <laughs> but uh but we we do um We do review them on a regular basis in our all hands meeting. And this is the way that we we started out by just reading them or reciting them or whatever. And where we've moved to, and and this um, this is the part I'm asking for some feedback on. Mm -hmm. We're when and we just did this this morning, literally, as as we're recording this, we had a a team meeting this morning, and I asked uh, people to grab one of the core values and then share an example of how they are applying it or how they are seeing it applied in the organization. So one of our core values is uh, courageous honesty. Uh, Don't hide things, keep things from our team or customers that would uh, negatively impact them. And then the person that shared that also said, here is how we saw that or here's what happened. Here's an example of that. Is that what you're talking about when you're saying operationalize them? I am standing, well, I am actually not standing, I'm sitting, but I am applauding internally. Yes, that is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. And it has to go one step further, which is that if someone is not doing that, I hope it's clear that I would not recommend that being called out in a team meeting. But people have to be made aware, hey, you know what? you're not quite working with this value of courageous honesty. Here is an instance that I observed where it wasn't done. It Mm -hmm. was not acted upon. You need to be, you need to step up on this because it should be part of performance evaluations. However you choose to do them. Yeah. And that's a whole, that's a whole other topic. Sure. (laughs) But, but, and that's the reason why I asked the question is because like, that's what I heard you say, but I also wanted to get clarification because 
to I, I want to give, I guess, some context around that as uh-huh. as I sit whenever you know, I was a major component of putting the core, list of core values together. So I mm-hmm. intimately understand what they mean and what the uh, inferred uh, explanations would be associated right. with them mm-hmm. um, as we've had them in place for several years. We've had new people come on board. Now there's a uh, there's a lot of assumptions being drawn as as you can read them. So to yeah. me, they're perfectly clear and make sense. And if you would were to read them, then you would exactly know what they mean. But that may not be the case for somebody coming in play. And it was right. brought to my attention years ago that said, "Hey, we we are talking about them, but can we have examples of them?" And so I was. It, I, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, uh, to insincerely communicate that this was all my idea. It was brought to my attention by <laughs> saying, can you help us understand exactly what yes. you're saying? Can you help us um, uh, operationalize what these terms mean so that when they are happening, then we know that that's what's going on? And so that's that's how we arrived at that perspective, because our people were asking, our team was asking, like, how do we know that this is working? Uh, and that's actually the fact that they were able to, courageous enough to come to you and say, hey, wait, stop. We don't get this. Mm-hmm. That is, in my view, I mean, limited since we've only been talking here for a few minutes, but that would be an example to me of somebody exhibiting courageous honesty because sure. they were able to come to you and say, hey, you know, there's a gap here. And I think, you know, the, another question that I like to ask people in, all around this is if you went to anyone on your team, anyone at all from the, you know, most recent hire at a junior level all the way up and said to them, how can you explain to me what this particular value means? Will, would they or would they not be able to give you a definition that was aligned with your expectation? Yeah. And I think that part of it comes down to what's the uh, what's the level of uh, what's, what's the term that I want to use? The level of uh, of uh, uh, man, I guess, integration. I guess if I were to go there, but level of integration of those core values inside of your organization. So as one of the questions that I ask a lot of new hires whenever they come on board is, have do, it, has any of the previous organizations that you've been at had core values? And pretty consistently, the answer that I get back is absolutely. And we heard mm-hmm. them all on the first day through orientation. <laughs> right, and then they just poofed. <laughs> yeah, and, and then we heard nothing about them ever since. And so, you know, that's always kind of been an internal challenge for us is how do we maintain that and keeping that as a forward uh, thought process? How do we keep it in front of everybody all the time? How do we encourage people to make decisions by them? Um, yes. And again, that goes back to the you know, what I'm hearing you say about the oper- oper- operationalizing them. Um, yeah. And I know we went off on a nice little uh, side um, side road to uh, on that, but I think it's very valid, especially for people that are listening. Say, yeah, we have core values, or yeah, we have these terms in our organization, but can people actually apply them because they know what they right. mean, or are they just? Which is what I find in a lot of t- types of conversation is I get a lot of head shakes. Yep, yep, mm-hmm. got it. And then it's like what does it actually mean? And it's like, I have right. no idea, but I just didn't want to say that I didn't know. <laughs> right. Right. And, and one point, I want to pull out one of the points you just made and emphasize it. These really done right, as you are pointing out, it is a part of the process of making decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, if, and, and if it isn't, then you have not fully operationalized your values. Yeah. But the core value should absolutely be part of certainly how you make important decisions, but really how you make almost any decision that that impacts how the how the company is functioning. Yeah, well, it's and it's cool too. Once it, I think, and I'm not, I don't want to pretend as if we've got that nailed down, but uh, at times it it boils up, and I was it, it's the pro, it's the proud moments of the organization. I was involved in a conversation the other day. And somebody else other than me said, well, based off of these factors, how are we going to make the decision in alignment with our core values? 
how does that work here? Well, that is where it's like, oh, okay, now we're really getting it. And it's not yeah. me just pulling this. Is It is literally how we're making decisions. At LockDock Security, we believe your camera system should provide more than just surveillance. Being able to see exactly what's going on at your place of business from your phone or computer is fantastic. But what if there were more analytics giving you the ability to improve your business operations? Track how many people visited your location, stopped by your display, and even how often they passed by your store. Be alerted if someone was loitering, vandalizing your business, or even dumping trash. It's time for you to take advantage of this technology. Contact us today for more information about our cloud-based camera systems, LockDock Security, helping you protect your people and property. So we've talked about this, and I so I don't want to I, I don't want to uh, again kind of beat on that, but I want to go back to in a few moments, if we can, unpack a little bit of the office politics thing because I know it, we teased that at the beginning, and so I don't want to sure. leave that off the conversation, but I do want to be intentional or mindful of our time, which is something that apparently I say quite frequently. Um, but <laughs> the the uh, the the office politicking thing, I, I think we've probably all. A lot of us have heard about it, seen it. Maybe we have been part of it. I don't know. Just kind of give me an understanding from a leadership perspective. How to identify it and what what should be done about it? Um, it is not something you either have or don't have. It's there. Okay. It's there. Um and politics are not necessarily bad. Whenever you have people interacting, you're going to have some kind of politics going on. Uh, where it gets bad is if you have, you know, favoritism or backstabbing or, you know, what what is often referred to as a toxic culture. But the ways to make it work for you have to do with recognizing, just to take a very, very simple example, nobody is going to promote your work better than you are. So, <clears throat> excuse me, if you think you're doing a good job, it is up to you to make that point to the people who need to know about it. Not in a way of, you know, look at how fantabulously wonderful I am, mm -hmm. but in the sense of, you know, I'm I'm working on this thing, it's important to the company, and I'm getting these kinds of messages from people about how they appreciate it. Because it's the people who, I don't want to say self-promote exactly, but and again, it's there's a there's a fine line between being arrogant and being confident, right? <laughs> and the real challenge is to be able to confidently make the point that you are doing something and not let other people walk on it in some way. And I mean and again, that's just one example, but we have to recognize that when there are people in the room, that have a hierarchy, which in organizations, there is always a hierarchy. Um, that hierarchy is going to be felt by everyone there. There's a very fun exercise I do in the workshop that I do on office politics um, that demonstrates this very, very clearly. Uh, which is everybody gets a, a playing card from just a deck of standard cards. They don't look at their card, but they hold it up so that the people in the room can see it. Okay. And then they pretend that they're at a company picnic and they're not allowed to say, hey, you're the CEO, but they talk to the people that they encounter and mix and mingle in the, pic in the picnic mm -hmm. um, with regard to the rank that they see the other person having. They don't know theirs. At the end of about five minutes or so, I say, okay, everybody line up. The CEO is the king. The king goes over there and, and nobody gets to tell anybody mm -hmm. who they are. They always, unless I've screwed it up, occasionally I screw up the instructions, but they always line up almost exactly in hmm. hierarchical order. Interesting. 
without knowing we, it. We, without knowing it. Mm-hmm. We unconsciously get signals from people. So the politics are there. The question is, how do we effectively work within them and understand the ways in which people respond to us based on the relative rank that we have? Again, just as a for instance, there are a lot of nuances in this, much more than we can go on, go into. In. <laughs> yeah, I, that's wild. So just based off of the way that people communicate, the way that they communicate to that individual based off mm-hmm. of their known hierarchy or their assumed hierarchy, you start to be able to perceive that. Yes. So if that's... The, I know. The first time I saw it happen, yeah. I was like, whoa. This is and an anomaly. I started actually using it as <laughs> sure. an exercise where I'm like, this is so cool. Yeah. So what do you do? Like, how do you work within that? I'm like, I, I'm, I'm kind of blown away by that, that exercise or that thought because... I don't know. I think uh, as a, in an organization, you would want to fight against that. And you're you're sitting here saying that there's a known hierarchy in any organization. And if that's the case and you're fighting against that, how do you how do you work? How do you how do you embrace it for positive, I guess, versus just taking it as that's just the way life is? I, I, well, I think to some sense. extent. Yeah, it does make sense. And I think. You can't fight it because it is, you know, I am going to, you know, if I'm the junior mailroom clerk Mm -hmm. and I run into the CEO in the hall, I'm going to have a certain kind of feeling about that interaction. And the CEO is going to have a certain kind of feeling about that interaction. You can't get away from that. It it is. It's a reality. Um, What you do, I think, is you go back to what I said earlier about the recognition, especially as leaders move up in the hierarchy, the recognition that what we do and how we do it has an impact on people. And assuming that we are good people who want to have a positive impact, then we will interact and behave in a particular way. And uh, as the more junior person I think it helps to understand our own um, feelings about authority and about how we have interacted with authority in the past and recognize, you know, where that might be tripping us up and how we behave. I mean, there's a lot that sounds a lot more complicated than it is. I think that as long as the leadership is behaving well, Mm -hmm. the people recognize that whether consciously or not and this is what creates a good culture i i i can receive that and and i'm trying to process it especially as if i were listening um from uh, or watching this video is okay i get it the way that i operate at whatever at whatever position that i am inside of an organization matters. That's my, I think that's the big takeaway is at at any point, other people are watching, other people are impacted by it. And so it does matter the way that my behavior, the the actions that I take, the interactions that I have, it matters. And even outside of the the four walls of your organization, if you're out at a, uh, a, a business luncheon and you're a jerk to the people that you're interacting with, or if you're kind, like that, that really matters because it carries major volume to uh, the people that you're working with, customers, uh, at any level. You're creating some type of uh, an expectation of, of who you are and, and how you want to treat others. Yes. I, I can give you another interesting example. This one is just one I've read about, and I really am dying for an opportunity to try it. All right. Uh, it was an example within a reasonably sized group of people. I I don't remember how many people, but it was at least 20 or 25, I think. And the facilitator had everybody stand up and close their eyes and just wandered through the room and then tapped one person on the shoulder. And that person was the, um, the viral seed, if you will, where at a random point, 
that person was to, they, they then all opened their eyes and just started milling around mm -hmm. quietly. Nobody was saying anything and just looking at each other. And that one person that was tapped at one point in the process was supposed to significantly change their facial expression. Okay. Within 30, and then everybody who witnessed that was to change theirs. Okay. In the same way. Within 30 seconds, everybody was frowning. Interesting. So these things, the ways that we behave go viral within organizations. It goes back to what I said earlier about that one team that I heard about where a dysfunctional manager was assigned to that team. It had been a high performing team and the performance just went downhill significantly. Now we can say, well, okay, it was a bad manager. But the point is that when you have one bad, you know, the old saying, one bad apple, it really matters. And in smaller organizations, each individual matters that much more because they are a larger proportion of the employee population. Grace, you have uh, brought a lot of <laughs> intriguing thought process and uh, and nuggets today. Um, if I were to walk away from this conversation with one major takeaway, the sentence that you just said, the way we behave goes vi viral inside of an organization, is should probably be plastered across the wall bigger than the core values because <laughs> that's I mean, that's powerful and it's um it's hard yeah that's that is powerful and it's for the positive or the negative exactly uh if people want to get in contact with you and go through this fun exercise where they hold a uh, playing card against their <laughs> head card. and there's actually some pictures of, of that exercise on my site all right well what, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you uh, outside of uh, just driving down to northern website, arkansas yeah my website is gracejudson.com so it's just my name uh, I am very active on LinkedIn, so feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. It's, again, Grace Judson. Um, yeah, that's that's really it. Grace, thank you very much for joining us today. It was, uh, it was a blast. Lots of good information here and uh, some great takeaways. I've got a, a full list of notes here that I think we can apply inside of our organization. A couple of really good points is make sure you're operationalizing your values once you've established them and you've got them set out. How are you uh, ex explaining them or exemplifying them and uh, working through exercises within your organization to make sure that everybody understands that? It's a really, really great tip. Thank you for joining us today. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe. All of our episodes are available on our website, lockdoc.net slash podcast. Check that out. And we will see you next time right here on the Coffee Break Podcast.